I'm Richard Wilson, and I'm on a driving tour of the UK. And the thing about the country lanes is that you never know what you're going to see when you go around the corner. But I'm doing it without the aid of modern technology. No sat-nav for me. Very twisty, twisty turny. I'm using the rather splendid collection of shell guides, first published in the 1930s, to see how Britain has changed over the decades. The shell guides sent you round the counties of Britain and mapped out where to go, things to do, and even what to eat. When they first appeared, going for a drive was a pleasurable experience. Uh, oh, mammy, daddy. Something that's harder to accomplish today. Good, wait, 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 good, I'm trying to reverse. Oh, shit. But I'm sure that me and my Daimler, which I have christened Deborah, will get us where we need to go. Today I'm in Derbyshire in the East Midlands of England, a landlocked county which celebrates the great outdoors, attracting over 20 million visitors every year. Following the 1935 guide, I'll be taking in the county's most famous view, plunging into the Georgian spa town of Buxton and stuffing myself with tart in Bakewell. This 1935 guide to Derbyshire stood out to me from all the others because it's very much the personal opinion of the author, Christopher Hobhouse. He claims that Derbyshire is a paradise. Now, that's a pretty big statement. And the frontier, he lists all the aspects of the county that make up his idea of paradise. Castles, seats of the nobility, picturesque scenery, towns, public buildings, churches, antiquities, etc. Now, that's a pretty long list. So I'm going to visit some of these places and see if they're as special as he says. My exploration of Derbyshire has to start with the county's jewel in its crown, the Peak District. Straight away, you can see why the guide says the county is so beautiful. It covers over a thousand square miles, most of which is countryside. This is my kind of place. One of the pictures that stood out for me at the guide was Monsal Head. We're going there now. Can't wait to see it. Monsell Head, with his view over the Derbyshire Dales, is the most famous beauty spot of the Peak District. One of the reasons I wanted to do this program was I, I love a good view. I love vistas, and I'm intrigued by what it is in a vista that gives us that uplifting feeling. And this is one of the best, best views in the county, Monsell Head. And that's the Munsell Viaduct down there. Uh, it's an old railway viaduct. Uh, there are other bridges down there. There are paths leading out and paths leading further down. It's just a spectacular piece of scenery. You know, a lot of people come here to walk. I'm not going to go down there uh, because uh, it's nearly lunchtime. I couldn't have picked a better day. Look at it. You have to realize that when Hophouse was writing the guide in 1935, much of this land was privately owned. You weren't allowed on it. The general public were locked out. What a travesty. So I'm driving up to the scene of an extraordinary event that took place in the early 30s. My guide says, a large portion of the open country is denied to the population of local towns for the benefit of 10 or 12 sportsmen. What they meant by sportsmen was that this land was owned by a few landed gentry who used it for hunting and shooting for a few weeks of the year. The public were denied access. 
So a part of Hobhouse's paradise was unobtainable to the majority. And in 1932, three years before the guidebook was written, ordinary people were so angry about not having the right to walk over this land, they organized a demonstration. The protest became known as the Mass Trespass of Kinder Scout, named after the highest point in the Peak District. To tell me more, I'm meeting park ranger Martin Sharp, who has worked in the Peak District for over 20 years. So, Martin, tell me about this mass protest they had. But if you've got to imagine people were in the cities and they'd look up at Kinder and places like this and want to be out there, yeah. especially on a Sunday, which was probably the only day they had off. And Manchester's just Manchester's over there. Manchester's just over there, Sheffield's just over that way. So yeah. they're looking at the Peak District and wanting access. But really, they couldn't get it. They couldn't go where they wanted to do some of these fantastic hills behind us. Uh, and so they kind of banded together and decided that they were going to come up en masse. So who were these organizing groups? Yeah, it's a workers' cooperative. cooperative. They, they, they were just all like kind of individuals that came together. Interestingly, the Ramblers weren't involved at the time. Yeah. Or the Ramblers Association. Um, so these people got together and, and they had a meeting. They had strategic meeting points. And then they had a rally in a car park at Hayfield, and then they marched up onto Kinder. There was still a public rights of way leading up there, and as soon as they stepped off, they met the gamekeepers. The gamekeepers had been kind of forewarned, the landowner had been warned. No man has the right to own mountains any more than the deep ocean bend. I'm a ramble, It was part of that confrontation and then partly the people getting arrested for X number of months for doing this that really brought the problem to a fore. I love a bit of civil disobedience. I think if that hadn't have happened, it would have just passed on by. So in 1951, the Labour government had the National Parks yeah, Act. The Peak District was the first national park to be designated. And um, now you can, Anywhere on that plateau, you can go walking. Right. Um, you know, you're free to freedom to roam. Today, all of Britain's national parks can trace their roots back to the incredible scenes that played out here. Well, it just goes to show what a small group of people can achieve if they stand together. Thanks to them, we can all enjoy countryside like this. It's not only humans that enjoy the Peak District, there are thousands of different species of animals that live here, and the guide devotes pages listing the wildlife that could be found in 1935. But there's one more recent animal arrival that I'm determined to meet. I've heard that there's an otter sanctuary nearby, and I'm very keen to see it. So I've overruled the producers, and that's where I'm going now. They're just near Chapel on Le Frith off the A623. Hello. Hello. The Chestnut Centre has been here for 30 years. I'm Richard. Nice to meet you. And its owner, Carol Heap, has devoted her life to rescuing animals. If you'd like to go around the other side, yeah. unless you want to drive it. No, I think I'll <laughs> let you drive, Carol, because. Now there's you know, a dangerous man. <laughs> you know the way. Yep. And I'm very good with female drivers. What, do you complain? <laughs> oh, I better hold on tight now. I've got 16 otters here at the moment. Hello. You are talkative. Oh, I can I understand otter talk. <laughs> He's saying, I want my grub. And they, I, I believe they've got two coats, otters, is that right? They do, yes. They have outer guard hairs, but then they have this highly dense fur underneath. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't go down well, would it? I wasn't paying attention, Carl. <laughs> they were. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the giant otters you've got, they're imported, are they? They both came from German zoos. They uh -huh. themselves were bred in captivity. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. They're huge. Aren't they? <coughs> How are we going to feed them? Oh, you are going to feed them. Oh, how wonderful. You're going to throw one of those into the water. Into the water? Without covering the rest of us with fish juice, please. <laughs> Here we go. Dinner time. 
What greedy beggars. Apparently, they eat up to eight pounds of fish every day. I hear you. Here we are. And here's the last one, coming for hers. OK. Oh! Oh! Although they're a good family unit, where food's concerned, they can be a little bit jealous with each other. Just like humans, then. And they keep in contact with each other by exactly what we're hearing now. Yeah. They never shut up. You can say that again. So can we see some other animals? We certainly can. Let's go and have a look at the deer. The Chestnut Centre is home to around 40 fallow deer, which were introduced to this country by the Normans. Aren't they beautiful? Beautiful. And their summer coats as well. True kind of dapples, spotty coats, aren't they? Yeah. And Storm's coming in, wondering what we're doing. And his antlers are still in velvet. In velvet? Yep. Well, look at I this. I don't think... Oh, this is Spirit. Spirit? I could have a chat with Spirit. You want to feed them? But you can see, even in a dark one, she's got lighter spots on her. Yes. What handsome creatures are so quiet compared to their noisy neighbours. Well, I've really enjoyed my visit to the Chestnut Centre. They're doing wonderful work here in preservation of otters and other animals. And I got to feed giant otters. I'd never seen a giant otter, never mind fed one. And I got to feed these wonderful deer from my hand with raisins. It's a rare privilege. This is a visit I'm going to remember for a long time. And yes, it is a bit like paradise. Time to leave the country and hit the town of Buxton Spa. I'm Richard Wilson. Today I'm in Derbyshire following the 1935 shale guide written by Christopher Hobhouse, who claimed that the county was akin to paradise. And the next stop-offs take me to two well-known towns in the edge of the Peak District that he thought were delightful, Buxton and Bakewell. According to Hobhouse, Buxton has everything the tourists could wish for. Let's find out, shall we? Buxton stands a thousand feet above sea level and is the highest town in England. In the 18th century, the Duke of Devonshire, who was one of the richest men in England at the time, spent a fortune developing Buxton as a spa town to rival Bath. Buxton, it is a delicious town combining the intimacy of a mountain village with the spaciousness of an 18th century spa. The town itself, while lacking in architectural beauty, has the charm of being full of open spaces and built of local materials. It is rather odd that Hobhouse says there's no architectural beauty, and he has given a two-page spread to his favorite uh, building. So I'm just going to go and have a look. From the Georgian to the Victorian era, the elegant crescent was full of hotels to accommodate the fashionable spa visitors. But in the mid-20th century, the buildings started to fall into disrepair and have lain empty for over 25 years. Richard Tuffrey is one of the council-led team, bringing them back to life. And I'm privileged to get a tour of the old spa baths before the builders move in. So here we are. Ah, smells. It does, yeah. Well, a bit musty. Of a bathhouse. <laughs> oh, yes. This is wonderful. It's fantastic, isn't it? Wonderful. This, this, this was the ladies' pool. It was by far the best space in the buildings. Yeah. And it's got this wonderful cast iron column and beam structure, which yeah. was from the 1853 structure. The architect for this actually worked quite closely with Joseph Paxton at Chatsworth. Mm -hmm. And you can see his influence, you know, with uh, the sort of elements of Crystal Palace here that um, Paxton went on to build in, in London. So how many conference. ladies would be in here? Who knows? Dozens, probably <laughs> dozens. But it, it was in constant use. Yeah. So uh, the demand was, was, was so great that the, there would never be a time when there wasn't somebody in the water. I can just imagine those bathers splashing around in their elegant costumes. 
Well, I may not be able to swim in them today, but I can at least feel them. Just over the road is the source of the water, St. Anne's Well. It's said to have healing powers. It's claimed that Mary, Queen of Scots, who suffered badly from rheumatism, came here to take in the waters in the mid-16th century. And the water that's coming out of the, the, the well there is about 5,000 years old. It's taken that long to work what? its way through the system. This water is 5,000 years old? Absolutely, yes, yes. My goodness. And if I drink this, will it make me better? The Emmy Hobhouse suggests that Buxton has absolutely everything to offer. I was hoping, perhaps, that I might have a dip in a nice, warm, thermal bath. But uh, it looks as though I'm going to be waiting for some time. Derbyshire is not only famous for its water, it also produces world-famous food. I'm feeling a little peckish, so back on the road to sample some. This is what I call going for a drive. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all roads were as beautiful and clear as this? The A6 cuts straight through the heart of the Peak District and is a blissful 20-minute journey to the market town of Bakewell. Well, all too soon, it's back to the usual town traffic mayhem. One of the places that uh, Hobhouse mentions is Bakewell. And you know what they make there? I've always been partial to a bit of tart. I know what a Bakewell tart is, but I've no idea what the pudding is. I have a feeling the producers expect me to find out, though. Looks rather tasty. Julie Hurst is going to teach me the difference between a pudding and a tart. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. So I've got here as an example of our maple pudding. Yes. This is what we're famous for. Yes. Our recipe dates back to the 1860s. So would you like to try a piece of the bakewell tart and the bakewell pudding and see which one you prefer? OK. Mmm, this is my type of challenge. So that's a typically iced bakewell tart with a drier sponge and a short crust pastry base. And the jam. And the jam. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the bakewell pudding, which is puff pastry, strawberry jam, and have you seen, we've added the ingredient, which makes quite a jelly eggy texture. Can uh -huh. you see the difference? Yeah. So that's your bakewell pudding. OK. Even more to taste. Excellent. Well, I prefer the pudding. Well done. <laughs> Was that the right thing to That say? was the right answer. <laughs> when it was made back in the 1860s, we think the young lady was making a tart or a frangipan. She missed the flour out, and what came out was a bakewell pudding. Right. It's like an eggy texture with there being no flour in. Right. So our company here have the recipe that dates back to the 1860s. Mrs Wilson... Um, Mrs Wilson? In relation to me? No. no. <laughs> Who owned this business, used to make candles, and I think she realised there was some money to be made because the dish had become popular at the local pub. She was a candle maker. She was originally. And she became a pudding maker. She did. Made a lot more money out of it than she did when she was doing candles. So in here... You've got ground almonds, eggs, butter and sugar, but there is a secret ingredient in there which I cannot tell you Can you, you whisper about. it to me? No. No. I'm not going to play that. No, no. <laughs> well, you can have a taste and see if you can guess. <laughs> yeah? No, no, no. She's a tough cookie, this one. There's no way she's going to divulge the secret. So, uh, am I going to do this? Yes, right. So, what you've got here is a puff pastry. Yeah. Is Sorry. the secret ingredient in there or no, in there? that's just puff pastry. OK. So, because this is a very light mixture, we need to have a flat bottom, so it ends up looking like that. Yeah. Yeah, yours is certainly better than well, mine. And this is... Uh, this is strawberry jam, seedless strawberry and jam. And where does that go in after That's, that? It goes in here now. So what you do oh, is you here. pop a little bit of jam in the bottom like that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to pop it in for you? Pop that in for me. OK. I think Mary Berry might have something to say about my soggy bottom. And then the next thing is the mixture. So you're looking to just cover your jam, which is about that amount, OK? OK. That's it. And then what we do with these now is we pop them in the oven for about 20 minutes, they'll bake and rise, then we turn the oven off, open the oven door, and they come back down and set again and they're ready to eat. OK. What a lot of bother, and I still don't know the secret ingredient. While I'm waiting for them to bake, time for a quick cuppa. First time. 
20 minutes later, and here's my masterpiece. Can you see? Nice? Yeah, very wow. good, but it needs to set. It's running. It's a very good pudding, though. I'm impressed by my pudding making <laughs> skills. But that's your tuition. It doesn't look as attractive as a tart, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yes. Hmm. So, did you enjoy your pudding, sir? It's delicious. I've, I've always been a fan of bakewell tart, but uh, the pudding. Is that your first pudding? My first pudding, yeah. I've got a very sweet tooth, and I mean, it's delicious. Very Moorish. They tell me there's a secret ingredient, but they won't tell me what it is. <laughs> um, Hop House and the Guide makes a passing reference to uh, Bakewell tart, but I've just made and, and tasted Bakewell pudding, which I think is much nicer. I think Hope has missed a trick there. In my 1935 Shell Guide to Derbyshire, Hope House said this was a paradise in Britain, and I tend to agree with him. It is extraordinary food, the purest water, and amazing architecture. But the thing that's impressed me the most has been its natural beauty. And I feel a strong debt of gratitude to the people who fought the powers that be to make it available to all. Next time in Durham, Deborah and I have a little difficulty navigating the roads. This is not what I'm going to do ever again. I visit the 14th century Raby Castle and I get to blast out a tune at Durham Cathedral. Oh, oh I could do that all day. Olivia Coleman and David Tennant return for the second series of ITV's Broadchurch here in half an hour. And tomorrow night, Julia Bradbury heads off on a quest, discovering the wonder of Britain. That's at nine. Coming up, Max finds himself in danger and David starts to panic. We're back to Coronation Street next.